The views expressed, opinions given, and any communication made between the hosts and guests of What Are You Afraid of Horror and Paranormal Show do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of Para-X Radio, EMC Network, or all services that play this show. The hosts and services are not responsible for the actions of their guests, and the original rights of all intellectual property is retained by the creator, and all work is used with either permission or Creative Commons license. The show is for entertainment purposes only. I'm horror author T. Fox Dunham. And I'm horror author and filmmaker Phil Thomas. And tonight we're asking you... What are you afraid of? The Paranormal Detective. I'm oh, sorry, let me do that again. Okay. Episode 141 The Paranormal Investigator and the Psychic Detective. We're back on What Are You Afraid of Power and Paranormal Show. How are you, Phil? I am good, Fox. Considering all the things around us, I'm doing pretty well. How about yourself? Hanging in, hanging in. It's been yeah. a rough few weeks, as, as I know you know. Oh, yeah, it it's, really has. It's just been stuck inside. And, you know, I get very fatigued when that happens. I don't have a lot of things I can do to exercise. And so my pain levels have shot up. My meds have been having a lot of side effects. So it's been kind of rough navigating it. Yeah, I know. It's, um, you, were, you were talking about how, you know, you're, um, you want to go out and do some more walking. Mm-hmm. Uh, start, start doing more walking as the weather is breaking now, you know, and uh, getting that exercise that you need. Right. And I, I've been... I've been uh, doing the same i i went out uh, a couple days ago when it was nice and today's a nice day too i might do some walking later on yeah that's the plan for us too you know you gotta you gotta keep your balance going your circadian rhythms and you know so for, for our listeners when you go for a walk which is what you should do make sure you put your headphones in take along your phone and listen to episodes of what are you afraid of horror and paranormal show <laughs> that's right we don't have that that commute a lot of people don't have that commute anymore Going yep. from work in the car, so so now uh, they're encouraging us to walk. You know, also encouraging social distancing, mm-hmm. but walking with those uh, headphones in and listen to our podcast, our show, listen yeah. to our show. Yeah. What are you afraid of? Because when you're yeah. home, you're streaming Netflix and it's kicking our ass. <laughs> you know, but I know, right? <laughs> but we are back yeah. on episode. What are you afraid of? We are back on What Are You Afraid of Horror and Paranormal Show We're on Parix Radio, nine o'clock Friday nights, and also. For those who want to listen to the show, you can find us on Lipson or go over to our website at www.whatareyouafraidofpodcast.com. Every episode is there. Every page for every episode is there so far. We're on 141 episodes doing this for a number of years now. We've had a lot of fun. And make sure to catch up on the episodes of Greg Bear were incredible. You know, No, they were. He was a great guest. He was incredible. Just, just to speak to an idol like that on the show. Plus, we had some wonderful ghost stories, paranormal investigators come on. We've got authors coming on. And we've got an awesome summer packed with some great content. So if you're stuck at home, you need some ghost stories, check us out. Now, I'm yeah. pleased on this episode because we're talking to two friends of ours that we've met before at places like Fort Mifflin. We've stayed in contact. And they've just been just sort of great to hang out with. And I wanted to bring them on so we could all hang out, have a casual episode, and see what's going on with their lives. We're going to be talking to, well, the paranormal investigator Paul Dixon and the psychic detective Tina Marie Williamson. Hello, Paul and Tina. How are you? Hi. Hey, T. Fox. Hey, Phil. How are you? Hanging in there with all this crazy stuff that's going on? Oh, my God. It's crazy, isn't it? So you two have been hunting ghosts for a long time. I read 35 years. Yeah. Yeah, both of us, yeah. 
that that's incredible. And Paul, you play the role of the well. You're both paranormal investigators, obviously, but your focus is on more of the paranormal investigating role. And Tina, you're the psychic detective. Yes. 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 Paul, during your teamwork, what do you do on a paranormal investigation? Normally what we do before we go and investigate or we do a walk, we focus on the information that comes through Tina because a lot of times before we go to a site, Tina starts getting a lot of stuff and we take notes. And then before we go into the place, we ground ourselves. We always ground ourselves before we go and do an investigation. Could you explain what grounding is to people who don't know? The easiest way to explain that is to make sure that, say you're a tree, you have roots at the bottom of your feet so that you're grounded and nothing can knock you over because you run into all kinds of energy. Mm -hmm. Um, I always tell people the best way to ground yourself is to walk around your house barefoot. Oh, Um, okay. That's what I'm barefoot con. I mean, I walk around barefoot. I also touch trees. Grounding is very important because we run into all types of energy every day. As you guys know, you can be when you walk into a store, you walk in to 20 to 30 to 60 different people in a store and you never know what kind of personality you're going to run into. And we're constantly, before we go into a store or wherever we go to we we're constantly putting blocks up we have to put blocks up right right i understand i mean you know with not being healthy when you have to protect yourself your well-being and that's basically what you're doing and everybody should do it against the living and and ghosts too the living more than the non-living every morning i get up right i ground myself every day before i leave the house whether it's for an investigation, whether it's going to the grocery store, whether it's going to work. And I think I've been grounding myself unintentionally right. the last couple of weeks because I've been walking around barefoot <laughs> the last couple of weeks without even you know realizing I was but grounding I, myself. Th- and that's true. People do it and they don't even realize that they're doing it. The, the thing is you take it one mm-hmm. step further when you're doing an investigation just to absolutely protect yourself from different situations. Okay. What are some of those situations? Uh, and I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm going to put that right out there at the beginning because I write mm-hmm. that. I don't advertise on my Facebook page what I do. If you go to my Facebook page, it looks like anybody else's Facebook page. You have to go to my Instagram page mm-hmm. or my other. I have a special Facebook page for what I do. I don't do personal reads. I only work with law enforcement. When I go into a case... I always have to make sure that uh, when I go onto a scene that I'm protected and everybody else is protected. It's my job to make sure everybody's protected. I'm the safety person. It's my job to make sure that everybody's safe and protected because you don't know the residual energy. It it would be the same as if you do a haunting because you got all kinds of energy there. Usually we don't know Um, what type of energy is there until we get there. Paul has been on a couple... um, Law enforcement cases with me. I go, I protect myself, I do say prayer. There are some officers that do believe. A lot, yeah. I would say about 80% of the law enforcement officers I work with believe in the paranormal. It makes your job easier. It's so great to have you on here. You've been investigating for 35 years, and it sounds like you're involved with many of the facets of this. We're What Are You Afraid of Par and Paranormal Shows is episode 141, the paranormal investigator and the psychic detective speaking to Paul Dixon and Tina Marie Williamson. So what have you been up to recently this year? What have you been investigating? I've been doing casework. I've been working on a book. It's finally in progress. It's finally in progress, but since I've been having some downtime, I decided to put all my effort into the book that I'm writing. Wonderful. What can you tell us about it? Well, it's it's written like it, it's going to be like the, my journal of my, my history in the paranormal. I started the first paranormal group back in 1955. Wow. We were the first, uh, my family was the first paranormal, to have a paranormal group in our county. And that's that's pretty, that's pretty impressive. 1955, that's, that's, yeah. that's a long time. And I was given some information from my aunt that uh, a log book that's dating back to 1964 of mm. all the cases that they've done. So that, that inspired me to start writing about that. And 
some of my experiences and some of my experiences with Tina. But it, it's and it's more like a journal, but it, it's in progress. The 1964 logbook that my aunt had given me, I, I would like to go back, try to go back and uh, retrace some of her steps and maybe try to do some investigate, like go and reinvestigate them, see what my findings are, and then put that into the book along with some of my personal experiences that I've had. So, Paul, some of these experiences you've had, when you're looking back, you and Tina, when you're looking back at your history in the paranormal, what is probably the scariest thing that's ever happened to you? We were doing a, a VFW. Me and my uncle, we were down in the, the basement. We were taking photos, doing EVP work. And I was facing a dark hallway. Mm-hmm. And I'm starting to hear somebody, like, they're stepping in, like, they're wearing work boots, and they're walking up the hallway. And I could hear them approach me. I'm like, okay. I don't see nobody. Hmm. So I'm snapping pictures, snapping pictures. All of a sudden, it just stopped right in front of me. Now, mind you, I've had stuff approach me from the sides, the back, but when it approaches you from the front, it's a whole different feeling. I bet. So it, it stopped right in front of me. I would say maybe a couple inches. I looked down. I didn't see no, no boots. I didn't see anything. Well, my investigator that was with me at the time, Robert, now, he's, now, mind you, he's a big guy, six foot four, 250, 300 pounds. He's a big guy. I looked up at him. He's running up the steps. <laughs> and I'm only five foot six. Mm. And needless to say, I bypassed him. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, and you know what? As a founder of the group, I got thinking, I, I should have done that. I should have stayed. But you know what? I look back. It scared the shit out of me. <laughs> but, but I can laugh now. But that, that's my my scary that that sounds pretty that sounds pretty scary i think i would have done the same thing i I might have done the same thing it's an instinct so tina how about you when you look back on your career what is the scariest Um, encounter you've had i've been in some weird situations but hands down was probably the two nights i stayed and i tell this every single time was the two nights we stayed at the hinsdale Hinsdale house it's in hinsdale new york New York, okay. How my gift works is, uh, and everybody's works different. I usually get stuff a week to two weeks prior to me going somewhere or a case that I'm working on. So I guess it was a couple weeks before I went, I kept seeing a lady in white. I was like, so I was expecting a lady in white to show up. And we got there and strange things happened. The first night it was like, okay, it's a haunted house, you know, no big deal. The second night, not uh-huh. so much. It was a whole different atmosphere. More from the, the get-go in the morning, second day, Marcy too, who does research with, with us. You you know her, yeah. T Fox. Okay, oh, Marcy yeah. Toot and I, I were sitting in the kitchen. We were wide awake. We were not sleepy. We were sitting there and we heard the most craziest guttural growl i've ever heard in my entire life i never want to hear it again i looked at her and she looked at me and we were like like i just can't even and it takes a lot to rattle me i've seen some pretty gruesome things because of what i do and this really shook me Uh, people think that things don't rattle you but you know, when you've been doing this for a long time, but I still sleep with a, I sleep with a nightlight and I don't have a problem telling people that. Everyone I think has their, their threshold of things they can deal with. Mm-hmm. And how long ago was that? Two years ago. Okay. Two years ago, we were with the Reaps then. It was Bill and Chris, Reap, and Paul and yeah. I, and Marcy. It, it rattled. Well, I'll tell you what though, when you're at the Hinsdale, you know, like when, when you're investigating and, and you need to take that break and step outside, you couldn't even do that there because you, you had you had energy inside. Oh, yeah. And then you also had stuff outside. Outside. So it was like a no-win situation. Yeah. Yeah. When people say that place is haunted, it, it, it's haunted. Uh, I'll never forget that place as long as I live. It, it sure sounds like it. <laughs> and would you ever go back? Absolutely. I just about... A month and a half ago, sent Dan a message and said, hey, <laughs> looking for, for a weekend to come back. So, yeah. Yeah. Because I have some unfinished business with the lady in white. So, yes. Excellent. Wonderful. I, um, I would go back. Paranormal Lockdown did an episode. 
at the Hinsdale house. Our friend Kat, Kat Weidman was there. <laughs> they were there and then they were at Wildwood Sanitarium, which is like not far from there. Wildwood Sanitarium. We went there because Katrina was there. The lockdown was there also. That's another place that's yeah. extremely haunted. So if you're in the area, I would absolutely recommend doing like both of them. It's very active. What was the most active thing you've seen there? It was very active. And the barn out back, we did not. Uh, when I went, we went with an open mind. I just go with an open mind everywhere because I don't front load. Because I don't front load when I do law cases. I caught, um, I believe it was a male figure at the barn. It was an interesting place. And it's 30 minutes from Hinsdale. Well, we'll have information up about both locations at our website at www.whatareyouafraidofpodcast.com where you can find all of our previous 140 episodes. We've been doing this for a few years now. Plus, our archive of ghost stories, they all have narrated elements to them. So you can read them or you can listen to them. And there are, I'll let any of them are up. I'm adding more and more as we go. Plus, our new interview selection. I've got interviews from Crash Code up. The authors of Crash Code from... Our wonderful Bloodbound books who published my novel, Mercy, and go over there and check out those interviews. Plus some material from my upcoming Coming Through in Waves, my book I am charity anthology to support the National Lim Leukemia and Lymphoma Society that I'm doing with Gutter Books, who published The Street Martyr. That'll be coming out probably at the end of summer, and I have some wonderful crime stories there. But You're editing that book. And I have a short story in there. Hey, you. Yeah, it's in the pile. It's in the pile, man. But I got to tell you, unless you're nice to me in this episode, I'm kicking your ass out. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I better be nice then. I better be nice. <laughs> I got the power, man. I'm an editor. We'll be right back with the wonderful Paul Dixon and Tina Marie Williamson on episode 141, The Paranormal Investigator and the Psychic Detective. This is Deepox Dunham. The dead demand to be heard. And on What Are You Afraid of Horror and Paranormal Show, Philadelphia's Horror Home... We listen. New True Ghost Stories every episode. Interviews with paranormal investigators. There is no supernatural. The natural world is just far greater than we can perceive. More information and expanded content at www.whatareyouafraidofpodcast.com. And follow us on Twitter at PF What Afraid of. Find us on all major podcast services, including iTunes, Google Play, and Spotify, iHeartRadio, or listen to us Fridays at 9 p.m. on the Parax Radio Network. I'm horror author T. Fox Dunham. I'm horror author and filmmaker Phil Thomas. So, so what, what are, are you afraid, afraid of? of? If you like what you hear, leave us a review on your preferred podcast service. What are you afraid of? Horror and paranormal shows. Speak to the dead. Illuminating the paranormal. Opening your mind to the possibility. We'll talk about all things metaphysical, paranormal, and everything in between. Illuminating the paranormal. Tuesday nights from 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern on Para X. But we are back with Paul Dixon and Tina Marie Williamson. They've been investigating ghosts and paranormal issues for the last 35 years. So, Tina, I did not realize that you worked with the police department. How did that get started? I think the year was 93. It was a very early 90s. One of the detectives from the prosecutor's office, one of the local prosecutor's office, reached out to me because he knew that I had abilities, asked me to help him on a case, with a case, and that's how it got started. <laughs> uh, you have to know somebody to get into this field. It's not like what people think it is. Um, <laughs> you know, people can write all kinds of stuff on their resume and on their Facebook, but it's not as easy as you think. He no longer is with us. He died. He is who got my foot in the door. I work with all levels of law enforcement. I prefer not to work with the local levels. That's just my preference. Mm. I like working more with the higher levels. They tend to be more accepting of right. The, uh, my abilities. I have a pretty good relationship with certain parts of the Pennsylvania State Police. I have a couple go that will call me. I've worked cases actually all over. I 
found a little girl in North Dakota from my home in New Jersey. Oh. Remote viewing and psychometry are my specialties. I've been in Massachusetts, Vermont. I, like, I, if I named them all, we would be here for a while. That's why I said I fly under the radar. People know how to find me. I have a couple great mentors. I have a mentor that worked with the FBI from California, Pam, and I have Melissa Leeper. She has been a godsend to me here. And Marty from New Jersey has helped me a lot. I mean, if, if, if I can add a little bit to this. Of course. So a lot of people think that um, it's like every, like once in a while she'll do a case, but this, this is all the time. It's nonstop. Like right now she's currently working on three cases. And wow. And it, it's all the time we have people knocking on the doors. Um, yeah. we, people reach out, and a lot of a lot of people don't realize what it take. It, it does a, a a toll on Tina. I, I see. I see it from behind the scenes. I see what it personally does to her. Mm-hmm. Every case that she works on, it takes a little bit out of her. Right. And it's something that she's not able to get back. Right. Yeah, um, it's it sounds like it's very uh, you know, I would say taxing work. You know, it takes a it takes a, a toll over the right. course of time. You know, and and both of you are very busy. You know, Tina's busy and you're busy, Paul. I want to know when the when the book series is coming out, the Paranormal Investigator and the Psychic <laughs> Detective. <laughs> I called it that. I thought it had a nice noir. Well, we are speaking to Paul Dixon and Tina Marie Williamson on episode 141, The Paranormal Investigator and the Psychic Detective, and it's been incredible so far. This is What Are You Afraid of Par and Paranormal Show. We're on Parrox Radio Friday nights at 9 p.m. And check out our website at www.whatareyouafraidofpodcast.com for more information, all of our previous episodes, our archive ghost stories, and lots of cool, fun stuff. So we're going to pause here. We'll be right back with Paul and Tina. We're going to play a short story that was sent over to me by Mark Allen Gunnels. He's an incredible author from the American South, and this is oddly appropriate right now. It's about, well, let's just say it's the end of the world. This is Red Wave, read by our wonderful and brilliant folk singer David Walton on What Are You Afraid of? Horror and Paranormal Show. We'll be right back. Mercy, a new horror medical thriller from author T. Fox Dunham, published by Bloodbound Books. Based on the author's horrific battle with a rare form of lymphoma that involved intense chemotherapy and radiation, Fox turns the horror of his experience into terror on the page. William Sane is dying of cancer. On most days, death seems like a humane alternative to the treatment. Stricken with fever, William is rushed to Mercy, notorious as a place to send the sickest of the poor and uninsured to be forgotten, and finds the hospital in even worse condition than his previous visit. Willie's memories faded. He grabbed his sack head, the sack head of the scarecrow, picking up the exposed chicken wire to hold them in. However, the memories fell out of the holes in his face. They wormed and crawled from the leather flesh and the old clothing of the scarecrow, then squirmed and wiggled down his body. The grounds are unkempt, the foundation is cracking. And like the wild mushrooms sprouting from the fissures of decay around it, something is growing inside the hospital. Something dark. Bangoria gives Mercy 3.5 out of 4 skulls. Dunham has channeled his many brushes with the other side into the exquisitely rendered lyrical supernatural hospital thriller Mercy. It's feeding on the sickness and sustaining itself on the staff, changing them. And now, it wants Willie. Come now, Mr. Saint. Just a little more of that sweet mail. <laughs> so salty and so good. You won't miss it. And we ever do so like our delicacies here at Mercy Hospital. Part medical horror, part supernatural suspense. Mercy is a hard-hitting fever dream of a novel. I enjoyed the hell out of it. Tim Wagner, author of The Way of All Flesh and Eat the Night. Available from Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and bookstores everywhere in both print and digital versions. Life is an addiction. Let go. Let it all burn. Red Wave. A fiction short story from Mark Allen Gunnels. From his anthology, The Daylight Will Not Save You. Read by David Walton. The Red Wave was coming and Kelly was afraid. She knew she shouldn't be. 
She was one of the chosen, one of the pure, yet she was afraid all the same. They all gathered out in the field in front of the church, the brethren of the righteous, almost fifty of them in total, a mixture of genders and ages, but all monochromatic and entirely of the Adam and Eve sexuality persuasion. That was part of what kept them pure and untainted and therefore would protect them from the wave. The congregation sat in a circle with Father Gallagher standing at the centre. He wore his crimson robes, his dark hair sticking up in tufts and coils, as if he were a cartoon character who had stuck his fingers in an electrical socket. Cartoons. Kelly remembered those and missed them, though she knew she was supposed to rejoice at everything from the old world falling away to make a clean slate on which to build the new world. The red wave is almost upon us, Gallagher was saying, his arms lifted towards the darkening sky, his eyes wild with a manic light. The latest reports say it will pass over our area in five minutes time. I can already feel the heat crackling in the air. Can't you feel it, my children? In fact, Kelly could feel it. A hot wind buffeting her face, raising sweat on her forehead, despite the fact that it was the middle of December. A certain static electricity also seemed to charge the environment around her, causing the fine hairs on the back of her arms to stand at attention. A red glow pulsed at the horizon. Might be the setting sun, might be something else. She couldn't be sure. You know what the fake news media has to say about the red wave, of course, Gallagher said a wry smile twisting his lips. They say it's man-made, that years of polluting the air and water with chemicals combined to create this deadly mist that destroys everything it touches. They think the wave can be explained by their ridiculous notion of science. The father spat out this last word like a curse, and the congregation responded with jeers and boos. Even Kelly, who knew that science was an elaborate lie that tried to convince people of improbable theories like Big Bang and evolution. Unrealistic fairy tales meant to confuse and deceive. They are half right, Gallagher continued. Man is responsible for the red wave, but it is not made from his pesticides and gases and radiation. No, it's made from his sin. Mankind has turned its back on God, ignoring his tenets, allowing homosexuals to marry and women to murder their unborn babies and those of darker skin to believe they are on an equal footing with their superiors. Because of this flagrant disregard for our Lord's commandments, a day of reckoning has long been coming and it is finally here, my children. God has sent the red wave to cleanse the earth to purify it. Like the flood of the Old Testament, the mist will wipe away all the evildoers and heathens, the atheists and liberal snowflakes, the homosexuals and women's libbers, the thugs and criminals. Only we, the brethren of the righteous, will be immune to the toxic fumes and corrosive components of the wave our purity will act as a shield so that when the wave has passed only we shall remain to rebuild the world. Kelly glanced at the horizon again and saw that the glow had grown meaning it wasn't the setting sun. It was the red wave, the luminescent mist that had already destroyed the entire western seaboard. Of course, it would have started in California, Gallagher had been known to say. Land of Hollywood whores and dope fiend hippies. 
and was steadily making its way across the Midwest towards the East Coast, leaving nothing but destruction in its wake. Even now, people are hiding away in their stone fortresses, Gallagher said, waving his arms in the direction of the town of Haversville. They think the thick walls will protect them, but we know better. You cannot hide from God's wrath. The wave will wash over them, eat its way through walls and ceilings until it bites into their flesh and devours them whole. They will die screaming, finally understanding the error of their ways only when it is too late to repent. We will hear their cries, but like Noah on the ark, we will have to turn a deaf ear. They have brought this on themselves, you have to remember that and from the rubble of the society they have brought to ruin, we will construct a new Eden. Kelly had heard reports on the radio about the underground shelters being built, people scrambling and fighting to get in, but Gallagher was right. It was a futile effort. The mist ate through any material, natural or synthetic. Still, Kelly wouldn't have minded being in one of those shelters with at least the illusion of a barrier between her and the wave. Blasphemy, she thought. God is all the protection I need. I simply have to keep hold of my faith, wrap it around me like a blanket. Here it comes, Gallagher screamed in an orgasmic frenzy, turning to face the advancing wave. Our time is at hand. Praise be to God. Kelly clasped her hands to her chest, abject terror encasing her in ice, despite the burning breeze that blew over them all. The red wave looked like a dense fog bank rolling inexorably towards them, a faint pulsing light inside that turned the mist a pinkish hue. As it approached, she could see trees and shrubs and telephone poles disappearing into the mass. What followed was a sizzling, like frying bacon, followed by the sound of trees and poles crashing to the ground. The telephone and power lines snapped and fell into grass like angry snakes spitting sparks. All around her, she saw enraptured faces and tears of joy, but Kelly wanted to run. She wondered if anyone else felt the same fear and was merely keeping it hidden. Her hands still clasped, she brought them under her chin and began to pray, asking for strength, asking for courage, asking for protection. Father Gallagher left the circle and ran towards the wave, arms wide open as if to embrace the mist to embrace his fate. Bring on your judgment, my lord. Smite down the wicked, show them no mercy. He dropped to his knees, inches from the wave, waiting for it to wash over him. As the mist reached him, wisps of it seeming to twine around his body, he suddenly let out a blood-curdling scream of agony and terror. Several members of the congregation jumped to their feet and called his name. He only answered with more screams as the mist completely obscured him. Mid-scream, Gallagher fell silent. A silence broken only by the pop and sizzle of the mist eating its way across the landscape. Everyone stood still, watching the wave roll towards them but then the father erupted from the mist, running towards them. He was a hideous sight to behold. His hair was singed, revealing bald spots, the flesh of his face seeming to melt off his skull like candle wax, a hole burning through his right cheek to expose his teeth and jawbone. One of his eyes actually popped, leaking viscous fluid. He gagged and coughed up gouts of black blood. Then he collapsed, first to his knees, then straight forward onto his face. His robes were eaten almost entirely away, just tatters and rags. 
This broke the group's paralysis and they turned en masse and began running for the church, their own screams piercing the air. Kelly ran with them, knocking into others and at one point actually leaping over Sister Eunice who had fallen in front of her. At 16, Kelly was younger than most of the brethren and she had speed on her side, quickly moving to the front of the pack. Behind her, she heard more shrieks of pain as the fog caught up with some of the others. She did not pause or look back. She remembered what happened to Lot's wife. She reached the church before anyone else and bounded up the steps. At the top, she took a moment to glance back, risking a salty demise, and saw the churning fog consuming her brothers and sisters, disintegrating bodies lunging forward and falling apart as they hit the ground, like poorly constructed mannequins. Brother Stephen, only two years her senior, and whom she had thought she might one day marry, crawled towards the church steps, fingers clawing in the dirt, his legs eaten through to reveal the bones beneath. But before he could reach the steps, the wave washed over him completely. With a strangled cry, Kelly bolted through the double doors and slammed them shut behind her. She scurried down the aisle between the pews to the altar and crouched there, her knees pulled up to her chest. She watched, trembling, as the doors buckled and the first of the stained glass windows on either side of the nave shattered, letting in the mist. The red wave rolled down the aisle, cresting over the pews, lapping closer and closer to Kelly. She thought about praying, but knew it would do no good. God was not listening. Just before the wave crashed over her, she closed her eyes and thought, I guess we weren't pure after all. Mark Allen Gunnels loves to tell stories. He has since he was a kid, penning one-page tales that were Twilight Zone knockoffs. He likes to think he has gotten a little better since then. He loves reader feedback, and above all, he loves telling stories. He lives in Greer, South Carolina, with his husband, Craig A. Metcalf. Rat! Rat! Where are you going? I'm going back to the paranormal view, back where I belong. Please, please, take me with you. No, I'm through with everything here. I want to see if there's something left in life I haven't explored. Do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, Rhett, Rhett, don't run to them. They talk about ghosts and hauntings, UFOs and all kind of supernatural scary stuff. You'll never understand, will you, Scarlet? No! Well, that's your misfortune. Rhett, 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 if you go, where shall I go? What shall I do? Frankly, my dear, Line. Oh, you've you got to be line. kidding. That's the Paranormal View with your host, Henry Foister, Jeffrey Gould, and Barbara Duncan, every Saturday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on the Para-X Radio Network. We're back. That was Red Wave, quite spooky. Oh, yeah. That was good. That was a good one. <laughs> End of the world. The story itself was just very fun and very stunning, and it's like sometimes you can't always know if God's going to pick you. But we're back with Paul and Tina. What's on the horizon for you guys? What's coming up? Because of what's been going on in the world, um, everything's been pushed changed and change. pushed back. And But we do have, um, we will be together uh, in July. That's the, I, I'm hoping it doesn't, we can be available for July. Nothing's changed. Um, Gettysburg's Battlefield Bash. Oh, um, Wow. Yeah, we, we both said that exact same time. Ooh, wow. we, were, we were there last year, and we plan on being there this year. And that's hosted by Pam and Steve Barry, who okay. also are the innkeepers of the Lookout House 
Um, which is another incredible which is place. another incredible haunted place if anybody goes there. Um, mm -hmm. So that's on the the immediate horizon. It's July 24th, 25th, and 26th. It's an incredible nice. time. Oh, yeah. The money goes to for incredible, incredible causes. It's for the Wounded Warriors of Pennsylvania Warrior. yeah. and for the kids with cancer, which oh. so it's such an incredible cause. Um, last year was a great turnout. So the, the whole event, the whole incredible. event, uh, like the energy there is great. Will that be at the Wyndham again? It is. Yes. Winding down the show, this is a question I ask a lot of the paranormal investigators that come on. So there's a lot of discussion about let's let's for the for the sake of what we're talking about, let's call them human and inhuman spirits. So something that we would call demonic or also spirits, you know, humans who have died and passed on and come back, but demons or inhuman spirits were supposedly never alive to begin with. Have, have you guys ever encountered an inhuman spirit before? Yes. Yes. Maybe a little over a year ago, I got an attachment. It, it turned out to be very bad. I think I know where I got the attachment from. There was eight months that went by that I don't remember anything. Oh, my. Oh, wow. That's... I mean, t I have my side of what happened. Tina has her side of what happened, only because there are days I don't remember. Mm. I'm just going to make this um, short and sweet. I had uh, two deliverances, and I had an exorcism done. Wow. Um, it was it was very ugly. That's serious it, stuff. Yeah. I mean, it is, and and I had people coming to help me. It, it was horrible. I mean, I, I remember saying some things to the priest that I don't want to repeat. I mean, there's there's things that 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 happen. It sounds like you're speaking of a disease. It, evil really does exist. It does That's exist. all I really want to say. It. I mean, you have people that that throws the D word around all the time. And I, I'm going to be honest with you. A true demonic is very rare. Yeah. Like three percent. They did your exorcism. They t they told us under five percent, like th right. like less than five percent. Well. I mean, they've taken me to places to have it done, but I, I can honestly say some of the days I do remember, I said horrible things that that I shouldn't have said. It made me dream things that a normal human being wouldn't dream. It was just, it was just horrible. I mean, for, I think it was more painful for her because only because there were days that I don't rem I don't even remember going to work. I don't remember. I don't. I couldn't tell you what day it was. Ending on a happy note, <laughs> yeah. Phil and I have had a lot of fun, and the best part about doing a show is that we've gotten a lot of comps, you know? Uh, we've gotten so much money from haunted houses and places like that. We come up and do the show, like, we did Penhurst that one time, and I think we got, like, $400 in yeah. free passes. Allison and I got that discount on the, um, the suites at the Marquis de Lafayette. They charged us like $80 for one night and we were there for two nights in that suite. They comped us like $600. And I felt I felt almost guilty walking past all those people at Pennhurst. Almost. Yeah, almost. <laughs> that line was like three miles long. We just walked right to the front, you know? Just through, yeah, we're celebrities <laughs> coming through. And they're like, I could feel like the eyes like staring at me. I don't know if you did, but it's like... Oh yeah. You know? e Fox. I saw your friend at the VIP party at Penhurst, and which which friend? <laughs> Katrina. Katrina. And she, uh, oh yeah, sure. She asked about she asked you. About you yes. <laughs> oh, did she really? What she said? I didn't know. It, it, well, now it's been what a year. Yeah. So yeah. I'm sure you've talked to her probably off and on. Yeah. By now, but she was trying to get a hold of you. I, she said she said she had been trying to get a hold of you because I yelled at her. Actually, I said to her, "How come you don't use your abilities? Because you mm -hmm. know, like knows like." And I wanted to know why she don't use her abilities. Mm -hmm. And she's like, "Well, that's a tough question <laughs> to answer." Mm -hmm. And so then we uh, were talking about you, and she's uh, like, "Oh, good I, things, good oh, things. good things." And she's <laughs> like, "I've been trying to get a hold of him." Really? That, okay. Yeah, have been trying to get a hold of you, she said. So wow. she did. She she just was very um into talking to you. So I hope she was able to get a hold of you. 
I think we did do another episode with Kat. I think I was actually going to invite her back on and coming up because she's doing some wonderful things and she gets a lot of attention for the show. She too. has the she's most incredible angelic energy around her. She uh, she should use her gift. Indeed, I well, we asked her about that once, and she's as somebody else that I really enjoy speaking to has been Heather Taddy. Also, she was on yeah. a Paranormal State, and she was on that. Alien show, alien, the um, alien, alien highway. highway. Yeah. Okay. With uh, Chuck Ju- Chuck Zukowski. Moo. Chuck Moo. the Chuck Moo. Mookowski. We have to we have to <laughs> yeah. say that Chuck Mookowski. Chuck Mookowski. You said it rhymes with Moo, so that's how we remember. <laughs> we are going to be winding down, but I wanted to close with one question. You talked about grounding yourself before you go on these investigations which is very important because a lot of times it's like a medical situation we talk about diseases and medical issues and it's like you go and you ground yourself and you put up this sort of protection now do you do cleansings after you do your investigations like to cleanse yourself of any residual energy we usually sage ourselves wipe your feet before you get in your car and tell them they can't come home with you We always, 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 always do that. We tell everybody to do that. I mentor some people, and that's one of the very first things I tell, teach them, is to ground yourself and to cleanse yourself before you get in your car. And there are certain other things I tell them to do. So, yes. Yep. So that's what I like to do, too, as I do the saging. And, of course... The sea salt. You can throw it on sea salt and vacuum it up. Yep. Some people put eggs next to their bed, freshly laid eggs. Yeah, they, I, they... I've heard that. Under Or under the bed. That I've never done. <laughs> mm-hmm. I've heard. Yeah, under the bed. Under exactly. The bed. There, was a, there was a book called Psychic Cleansing that was really good. Now, before we go, I want to tell you all a little story that happened to me the other night. Okay. okay. I don't know what I was talking about this, but, you know, we're in Lancaster, And it's been great living here, but after this whole pandemic happened, things have been a little tense around here. And they've taken the homeless, um, those who are addicted to drugs, people without homes and places to go, and sort of penned them in in this park up on the Lancaster Square area, which is like the town center. Oh, yeah, I I meant to ask you about that. Has there been any any more... No, that's, let me tell the story. Yeah, yeah. it's, um, so Alice and I are trying to go for walks, trying to make ourselves feel better, trying to lose a little weight, and as we pass this area, like, the police aren't going there, and it's chaos. <gasps> it's absolute chaos, because people have nowhere to go, and they're getting into fights, they're yelling at each other, it's the kind of situation where you're waiting for a, a gun to be pulled, mm. or something like that. It was scary. And then, Sunday night... We're in bed, Allison's sleeping. We're in a little apartment off of North Duke Street, a couple streets down from that area. We're basically in the center of town. It's a very nice area. It's probably the wealthiest area of Lancaster. We're in this little apartment in the back behind some townhomes. And all of a sudden, we hear this explosion. Mm. And everyone's been telling me what it was. It's like, it wasn't a gunshot. It wasn't a firecracker. I've heard all those things. It wasn't. It was a booming single explosion it wasn't thunder definitely not thunder it wasn't anything like that it was like a firecracker like... or something like m80 or no no, no. much much louder no. much <laughs> lower in tone like mm. like you've heard i've heard firecrackers and i've heard m80s this was a boom, mm. boom. Mm. yeah and so it freaked us out and i'm like what was that my first thinking was like did a transformer blow did so i went to the window and before i got there through the curtain, the window lit up and glowed, orange and yellow light. Wow. And it lasted two or three seconds afterwards. It wasn't a quick flash. It lasted. And then it went away, and I went to the window to look. And in the dark, I thought I saw some black smoke, but it was very hard to see. I may have been seeing it. It wasn't there. We had no idea what it was, and I sat there debating whether I should call the police or not. And then I worried somebody could be hurt. If a transformer blew, perhaps it was a fire starting somewhere. This is 11.50 last Sunday night. So I I didn't call 911. I called the switchboard. I called the radio room and told them what happened, gave them my name and phone number. And a few minutes later, I saw a cruiser going down Cherry Street, going down the alleys, looking for nothing, you know, looking for something. And I never heard anything back. 
The next day, we go out to get coffee. We walk over to the wonderful Lancaster sweet shop where they do coffee and ice cream and stuff. And there was actually somebody from the local power company, PPL, and I asked them if there had been any transformers blown or anything like that. He did underground lines, but there was no mention. Everybody was fine. Everyone in power. I checked for lightning strikes. The closest was 300 miles away. I checked the power grid. Everything was fine. I even wrote to the newspaper and asked them if they'd heard of anything, but nobody knows what happened. Really? Um, wow, yeah. that's, that's really bizarre. That is bizarre. So you still don't know exactly what that was? No, we have no idea. I went for a walk that morning and couldn't find any evidence of anything that happened. Did you go to MUFON and look and see if anything was reported there? See, that's what I'm thinking is maybe there were two, I had two thoughts that perhaps it was something from MUFON, like, a, you know, it's like an extraterrestrial or even sometimes meteors yeah. Yeah. can hit the lower atmosphere and detonate. And it's exactly what it would look like. But yeah, I was wondering, did something paranormal happen? Did something alien happen? When you were having trouble connecting at the beginning and you kept hearing clicks. Yeah. Um, there was a young female that kept coming through. Okay. And she died very young. Um, and she was with you. Okay. Mm. Do you know who that is? Well, it could be... Don't tell me, but do you here. know who it, who it would be? Because she's with you. Yeah, there's a very good chance okay. I do. That's who was clicking your line. I have the hair on my body standing on end. So, mm -hmm. And that's who's with you. And I mean... That, that would be a comforting thought. I just actually. wanted you to know that. Yeah. Yeah, but I just wanted you to know that, that she's with you. Because... Okay. It, that's her only way of letting you know is by chance See, that then with the clicks that Tina looked at looked at me and I looked at her. I I, I don't I didn't even know if you heard me say that to Paul when you were like having yeah. trouble with the clicks and I, I whispered to him, I'm like, it's a young female. Mm. That would be that would be comforting spiritually, especially with, with a lot of the people I've lost in my battle with cancer, but also it would be nice to know that the technical stuff isn't my fault. <laughs> it isn't your fault. <laughs> well, we mean that. <laughs> so, and it's you. It's not Phil. It's you. she's with you. So I and it, she was like standing right in front of me, and I was like, "Here we go." I'm not. I'm not hearing the clicks anymore. I think they. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. I've heard a few, but mostly they've cleared up. Especially when Paul and Tina were talking. But so Phil, my ghost isn't cheating on me with you. Is she? <laughs> no, no, she's not. No. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm sorry I disappoint you. <laughs> oh, that would be a good story, my cheating ghost lover. This is What Are You Afraid of? Power and Paranormal Show. We're on Pararex Radio Friday nights at 9 p.m. And check out our website at www.whatareyouafraidofpodcast.com for all of our episodes, our ghost story archive. And you can find information there about Paul and Tina. We'll see about getting some of those photos up and links to their Instagram and stuff like that. And go over and check out episode 141 we've got a cool season coming up we're working with paul williams in australia to come on and do a jack the ripper episode yeah that's gonna be fun our friend bill wrote the questions for that and he really got some good ones bill. in there <laughs> yeah bill bill our friend bill who's probably sitting at home listening to this hopefully by the time he hears this we'll all sort of be going back to a normal life and he'll be back to septa and everything will be good yeah let's 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 hope so let's really do because it's getting yeah. It's getting tiresome. Yeah, I need my wife to go back to work. <laughs> why do you why do you need her to go back to work? She's going out of her she's going out of her head. Yeah. She's just she's been very lucky because her job is secure, but she's working from home every day. I've been working on my website a lot too lately. I have a Good. personal website. I, I want to briefly mention it. Um I don't yeah. have an ex uh, exact domain name yet cuz I still have to pick one, but I think it's going to be uh, it's well. I can tell you what it's not going to be. It's not going to be www.philthomas.com, and the reason <laughs> okay. be, the reason being is I actually looked it up to see if someone took it, and yeah. th this is what it says. I have I just pulled it up here. It's, it's this guy says, "Welcome to philthomas.com." There's not a lot to this website. I'm just holding the domain name for my presidential campaign in 2020. Uh, okay, <laughs> you ought that, to write them because of that. I can't use it. 
<laughs> so it's That's a joke. Awesome. It's a joke, though. And then he continues to say, in the meantime, if you came to the site looking for a Phil Thomas that you knew from school or somewhere else, please email me here. I would love to hear from you. And then, and they have a picture of some dude with a weird face. Like that is the website. And I, I'm, I'm tempted to email him. Like, dude, can you drop this domain name so I can use it? Because that's ridiculous. So anyway, what I'm going to probably use it as uh, I've came up with this thing. It's called Phil's Laboratory on the website. So I'm probably going to call it philthomaslab.com. That's what I'm leaning okay. towards. But yeah, it's just I am going to email this guy because I'm going to send you a link too, Fox. I want to hear what happens. Just have to see this because it's it's really a, really absurd. Happens. That's wonderful. He's holding it for his presidential campaign in 2040. Good Lord. (laughs) Well, you know what you should do? What? You should run for president in 2040 (laughs) and screw him over. You know what? Take all of his material and... (laughs) Only another 20 years, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's what you call... That's what you call revenge... uh, That's what you call revenge served cold, right? (laughs) Yeah, that is is ice cold. But Paul and Tina, it's been wonderful speaking to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Hopefully we'll see you in Gettysburg. Yes. Oh, you'll see us. Oh, you'll we'll see find you. We'll look for you. <laughs> <laughs> but this has been episode 141, the paranormal investigator and the psychic detective on What Are You Afraid of Power and Paranormal Show. We'll be back with 142 in a few weeks. Check out our website at www.whatareyouafraidofpodcast.com. We're on Parax Radio at 9 p.m. And if you got any ghost stories, send them in. We'll have our voice actors record them. It's been great. This is T Fox Dunham. And this is Phil Thomas. I want to know when the when the book series is coming out, the paranormal investigator and the psychic detective. <laughs> Phil Thomas is an author and screenwriter from the suburbs of Philadelphia. His screenplays have been produced into two feature films. False Face and Always from Darkness, and are available in major retailers such as Best Buy and Target, as well as availability on Netflix and Amazon Prime On Demand. His screenplay, Three Tunnels, was a semi-finalist at the LA Screenplay Competition. He is a member of the International Association of Professional Writers and Editors, and he currently writes for Cultured Vultures, Game Skinny, and BloodyDisgusting.com. He formerly held the position of Senior Marketing Manager at Eternal Press and was a journalist for Patch, where he wrote a daily tech column covering the latest electronics and gadgets. He lives in the suburbs of Philadelphia and is currently working on his second novel, Worst Afterlife Ever. T. Fox Dunham lives in Philadelphia with his wife, Allison. He's a lymphoma survivor, cancer patient, modern bard and historian. His first book, The Street Martyr, was published by Gutter Books. A television series based on the book is being produced by Three Line Films. Destroying the tangible illusion of reality or searching for Andy Kaufman, a book about what it's like to be dying of cancer, was released from Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing, and Fox has a story in the Stargate anthology Points of Origin from MGM and Fandemonium Books. Fox is an active member of the Horror Writers Association, and he's had published hundreds of short stories and articles. His motto is Wrecking Civilization, One Story at a Time. Find out more information at www.tfoxdunham.com. The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors.